thank you so much. Uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, tonight, this afternoon, I'm going to present uh, my uh, our tool, MapSafe. Uh, so a little bit of background uh, already been said. A research fellow at the University of Auckland. Before that, I was a PhD student at the University of Otago. And before that, I was an IT lecturer in Fiji. And I've also worked in the public and private sector. So that's me. Uh, enjoying Fiji and Drua, the rugby team's win over Canterbury Crusaders in March this year. So what's my background in GIS data security? In early 2000, um, there was an innovative product being released where the files, flat files can be encrypted within the database. And we built a security solution around that. And that resulted in my master thesis. And I did uh, two other projects while I was working in the University of South Pacific. Now, in the last two years, I've been working as a research fellow at the University of Auckland, where we have developed two tools. Very similar, but uh, some of the approaches are quite different. I'll explain more as I go. But, so I'm presenting the first tool, MapSafe. In between my master's and my research fellow, I was working as a PhD student at Otago, and my research was on open source software. I invest investigated different decision-making aspects within the Python and Bitcoin community, uh, decision-making processes, the rationale behind decisions, whether one person makes the decision or is it more collective. And we investigated the influence mechanisms within the Bitcoin community. Based on my research, we, uh, I released uh, two open source projects, uh, DMAP Miner and Rational Miner, which can be used to extract these decision-making processes. And we had good outcomes. We had uh, uh, the, presented our work at the highest conference in software engineering and in information systems. Right, so maps have historically been used by different people in different ways to distort the truth, to distort the truth, or to take over land and resources of other people. The sovereign data owners should have control over their data. But what we see nowadays is cloud or third party based data storage services being used progressively. So how can we have the best of both worlds? How can we use the cloud, but at the same time safeguard their data? There are cloud based encryption solutions, but they only provide on off switch, meaning you can either encrypt it or you don't. We, there is no middle setting. And that's where our tool comes in. We cater for different sets of users with different access levels and uh, provide a solution which they can use from the browser, from within the browser. Normally, if you want to obfuscate geospatial data, we can use geomasking. Geomasking, basically what it does is shift the original location to a random location, and thereby we provide an approximate location. For example, if, if you have seen news reports, if they want to report crime locations, they will show a approximate location, not the original one. So that's for uh, geomasking. Another approach is to aggregate the data. We can use hexagonal binning to show the density of points. So that approach is good to obfuscate the data. What about if you want to safeguard the original data? Encryption can be used. But, so encryption can be used, but there's one slight challenge. How can we ensure that the encrypted data is authentic? Normally, what we do is we use a hash value, create a hash value of the encrypted data and put and share that hash value. But oh, that's a slight problem we have that hash value can also be changed. The encrypted data together with the hash value, both can be tampered with. So now what do you do? So that's the challenge we have. If we want to cater for different sets of users with different access levels, how do we have, how do we cater for that? And that's where our tool comes in. 
MapSafe is a browser-based tool. All the security functions are implemented within the browser. First step, users can upload their shape file. We perform either geomasking or hexagonal binning, and then we proceed, can perform encryption, and then we notarize a hash value of the encrypted data set on the blockchain. So as, as you know, blockchain is a temper-free platform. So once the hash value of the encrypted data is on the, on the Ethereum blockchain, it cannot be tampered with. So anyone who receives the data set, the encrypted data sets, can first go and verify, create, recreate the hash value of the encrypted data, verify, and then go on to decrypt and display. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm using two, a run example of two users. Jane, who is a sovereign data owner, who wants to, who wants to safeguard the locations of, uh, she has found some drill sites, new oil drill sites within north, north of Oakland, North Caramanda. She has found some, and she wants to share it with Bill, who sits in, say, North America somewhere. And then there is different sets of users in between also. So how does she do it? First of all, she performs, she loads her shape file onto the browser on our website, and she undertakes geomasking. She selects the minimum and maximum distance, and then the original points will be shifted to those to a random distance between the user provided boundaries. How in geomasking, I challenge is how to balance utility and privacy. If she shift the point too much, then it won't be useful. But if she, the points are shifted very near to the original locations, then it, there's a chance that it would disclose the original locations. So we have included a measure called Spiral's measure. It's based on theory by the person Spiral, and um, it, we, it has resulted in a privacy rating. Basically what it does is it checks each of the obfuscated locations to make sure they're not nearer to any of the original location. And as you can imagine, that procedure takes a bit more time than just masking. So we, it, that's an option within our tool. If there's another approach she can use, is she can perform hexagonal binning. Using the Yuba H3JS library, we could only show the density of points. Where is the main location? Uh, the user in this case, Jane, she will choose either the resolution and the buffer radius. And then she proceeds into the encryption step. In encryption, she can choose either she wants to encrypt all three levels or just one level. Basically, it means that whether she just wants to encrypt the original data set or the obfuscated versions together. Now, um, once she has done encryption, she is now in a position she can control who to give what level of access. The uh, original data set is encrypted using 15 times of the passphrase. In, it's encrypted in a way that the same encrypted value, encrypted data set can be passed on with different users. And they will be shared with either 15 times passphrase, 10 times passphrase, or five times. By doing that, they can encrypt to that particular level. Now just a little bit about the performance of the encryption and the masking. How long does it take to mask and how long does it take to encrypt? Masking, we have found 1,000 points can be masked within one second. So that's quite fast. But we, if we include the spirits measure calculation within that, it takes a bit more time. Encryption, if you, if you want to encrypt the, all the three levels, six seconds per megabyte we can encrypt. Decryption is uh, much faster, 0 0.8 seconds. Now, these times are reasonable based on the fact that indigenous or sensitive data sets are generally not that large. 
there won't be much too many uh, coordinates which uh, needs to be safeguarded. 1,000 points within one second masking is actually OK. And uh, if it's not necessary that all the three levels need to be encrypted. They can, the user can decide to only encrypt, it, encrypt the original or the two levels or all the three levels. Finally, the hash value of the encrypted file is notarized on the blockchain. Now the bill, when Jane shares this encrypted data with Bill, Bill will first want to ensure if the encrypted data is the original. So he, as soon as he loads the encrypted volume, a hash value is computed. And he can compare this hash value with that stored on the blockchain. Then he can proceed to decrypt and to the main, to the original data set. Based on the user's privilege, a corresponding data set with a certain detail will be shown. If he has all five, 15 terms of the passphrase, they can see the original data set. Otherwise, for semi-trusted and untrusted users, they will see a different level of detail, different level of obfuscated data set uh, representing the original. Now, I've included a video to show, a small video to show the safeguarding and verification process. So for notarization on the Ethereum blockchain, they will need a MetaMask, it's a small plugin. So here the Jane is choosing the masking parameters and then choosing a random passphrase. So this is the 15 time passphrase. And then the hash value of the encrypted data set is notarized on the blockchain. And that's the URL where the, the hash value will be notarized. Right now, at the moment, uh, it's pending because uh, minting on the blockchain takes a little bit of time. And this is the PDF. In, the, in that meantime, we produce a PDF for them so that they can know which URL, the file name and the hash value will be notarized. So once Bill receives the, the encrypted data, he can go on to verify and display the data set. So this is the hash value computed, and he can compare it with that stored on the blockchain. And then he can enter the passphrase, which what he's supplied with. And he can display the original data set. Now, other users in between who have got different uh, privileges, they will see a obfuscated version. Right, so what have we done? What we have done is provide users with our approach where the different, they can have not only a on-off switch, but a different, a tool which can cater for different users with different access privileges. So we can in store this encrypted value on the cloud, encrypted volume on the cloud, and decide, okay, someone needs to view the original data set, we can pass all the 15 terms of the passphrase, and someone after one month comes along, they are not, uh, they are semi-trusted, we can only supply them with 10 times of the passphrase. We have some limitation in our tool, it's browser-based, so it cannot handle large data sets, more than 100 megabytes. And uh, geomasking in general, sometimes depending on the different data sets, you can combine the other sources of data and actually locate what we are actually trying to hide. For example, if you're trying to hide crime locations within a street, but there's only one street in that area, but you have masked the point which represents about 100 to 200 meters away, 
anyone can make out that the crime location would be happening within the street. So based on the data set, you have to perform geomasking to us, choose geomasking thresholds to a higher degree. Um, yes. Okay. So at the moment, we only handle point-based data sets. We are not lines and polygons. And um, what we are uh, going to talk about next is how we integrated our tool within GeoNode. Right, so our project was mainly for indigenous data sovereignty. Uh, our MapSafe tool uh, is for general geospatial data. But when we integrated, uh, when we wanted to present as a case study to safeguard biodiversity management areas, for example, in pest infected trees in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there are about 40 biodiversity management areas north of Auckland. So the main challenge is, main requirement is the 40 representatives have a user each in GeoNode. They should be able to access any data which has coordinates falling under their regions. So as soon as they upload their data set, we have a script which actually checks where these coordinates fall. And based on that, we encrypt the data based on public private key encryption approach using the public keys of these users and make it available to them. Uh, the, th the other thing which is different is the notarization. In a MapSafe, we have notarization using a MetaMask wallet. Each individual user has to connect to, her, to their blockchain address. But within, the, uh, within GeoNode, what we have implemented is they can mint through a central account. They don't have to use a wallet. So every hash value is minted within the same account, uh, blockchain address. Right, so, so what do you expect out of this tool? We expect once our work is published, once uh, awareness about these tools are being uh, spread, conversations should start. And then people, when new data ecosystems are built, indigenous people should start m demanding that these tools be integrated as part of those uh, projects. That's what we are expecting. Now I'd like to acknowledge the Ministry of uh, Business, Innovation and Employment. Uh, based on their funding, we were able to develop this tool. And also um, the funders, Mr. Dean Henderson, Cecilia Arienti and Waitang Yud for their guidance. And also the University of Auckland where this tool was developed. Thank you. Any questions? So we have time for questions. So do you have any question? Right yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm volunteering for the day. <laughs> Get it all. Thanks for that. It was really interesting. <laughs> um, the tools, what the client side tools you used for masking and binning, are they generally available tools or are, you, are they open source? So our tool is the whole MapSafe tool is open source. The library, most of the libraries we used are open source. We used for masking. We used uh, a library called maskmy.xyz. That whole masking library is performs hello masking. That's open source. We use OpenLayers and we used uh, OpenStreetMap. And then for hex hexagonal binning, we use Ubuzz H3JS, which is again open source. And uh, for notarization, we used Web3.js, which is open source. And the critical part is the encryption, the three level three layer encryption. So. That was what we did, and uh, basically the whole the whole tool is open source. So yeah, yeah. That's impressive. Any other question? So I do have one. Uh, you have tasted. Uh, you have a case study with uh, yeah. user indigenous people. How did they receive it? Because for some people, it might be a little bit complicated to use. Or did you find? Yes, yeah, so we have made sure it's not at all complicated. So we have uh, no, not we have not uh, implemented the MetaMask uh, wallet. So they can just um, press the mint button; and it's automatically sent to uh, Node.js process on the MapSafe server, which mints it on the blockchain. So make sure, and we have tooltips all within each of the step in the 
in the workflow. But I didn't go into detail about the Geonode and Indigenous Data Sovereignty because that paper is not published at the moment. We, <laughs> we have not been able to, at this point, we haven't actually deployed it within the Indigenous community. But we are constantly getting feedback and we have changed a few features to enable the sovereign data owners to actually have access to the data and make sure they are in control. Okay. So is, uh, stay tuned, there is more. <laughs> yes, actually, I was thinking that maybe next, once that paper is published, then maybe next year in uh, 4, 4G, I could present it. I don't know where it is. Ah, that will be good. We still don't know where we'll be, but <laughs> we will let you know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much.